I'm often asked by young people and others interested in a possible career transition, what do you need to become a mediator? Never accept their first offer. What is your second offer? Do you often have friends or family coming to you for help in working out their conflicts? Or maybe at the office, you're the go-to person whenever your colleagues are in a dispute? And importantly, do aspects of these interactions actually feel rewarding to you or gratifying or even fun? If so, then you actually might enjoy being a mediator. I'm Bob Bourdon. I'm a senior fellow at Harvard Law School. I'm the founder and principal of the Cambridge Negotiation Institute, and I've spent the last two decades serving as a mediator, as well as a conflict resolution scholar and practitioner. Today, I'm coming to you from my office because the Omicron surge has kept me here, but I'll be back in the studio soon and didn't want you to miss a video in between. So in this video, I'll describe what mediators do, the different kinds of mediators that exist, important qualities that mediators have, and then four steps you can take to become a mediator. If you stick around to the end, I'll share a secret about a quality of mediators that I think make them particularly successful. Now, in the simplest of terms, a mediator is a neutral third party who helps parties in a dispute or conflict work with each other to hammer out their differences. There are some people whose full-time work is mediation, but many others mediate as some part of their work. And of course, most of us, at least at times, find ourselves informally helping mediate disputes in our families or maybe our workplace or a church, synagogue, or mosque, even though we might not formally call ourselves a mediator. There are really too many types of mediators for me to discuss every single kind in this video. Broadly, however, I wanted to divide mediators into several groups. One kind of a mediator is someone who works in a multi-party context to help parties work out an agreement. For example, this can be at the local level or the national level or in some kind of public policy context or even in an international context. Some of my colleagues, for example, focus their work on environmental mediation in public contexts. Imagine a situation where perhaps a major developer has proposed constructing, let's say, a deep water port in a city on lands that formerly housed warehouses. These warehouses have been abandoned for years, and so the deep water port promises to really be revitalize a whole sector of the city, bringing perhaps billions of dollars to the region. But the construction also has environmental implications and implications on wildlife in the area. Plus, the change will impact everything from traffic flows to housing to public infrastructure. So a mediator might work with a large group of stakeholders to help them hash out an agreement that maximizes gain for all. In the international arena, arena a mediator might help broker a ceasefire between warring parties, or a mediator might help broker a more sustainable peace. In the late 1990s, for example, U.S. Senator George Mitchell served as a mediator that helped broker the Good Friday Accords that ended violent conflict between unionists and the IRA in Ireland. Locally, there are family mediators who help couples who are divorcing divide their assets or deal with complex issues like child custody or visitation or alimony. Other kinds of family mediators might work with families who are dealing with conflict around succession of a small family business or challenges in dealing with an inheritance after the death of maybe a family matriarch or patriarch. I'm particularly interested in this kind of work. If you've ever watched the HBO show Succession, and it's one of my favorites of all time, you can see why mediations are very messy and very complex. There are also workplace mediators who help parties who might be in conflict with their boss or fellow employees or coworkers. So workplace conflict is another domain where I do a lot of work. So as you can see, I find myself particularly drawn to mediations where there are thick embedded relationships like families and workplaces, where emotions can sometimes run really high, and where strong partisan perceptions that are developed sometimes over a lifetime can be the source of high conflict. Now, that's not for every kind of mediator. There are also more traditional legal mediators. These are people who maybe work in commercial or litigation space, often helping parties come to terms around payment uh, or maybe for the release of an obligation or to end a lawsuit. Finally, there are just a lot of people with an interest in mediation who maybe don't mediate full time, 
but they volunteer in small claims courts or in schools or nursing homes or other places where conflicts can pop up. So if you're thinking about becoming a mediator, you don't need to know exactly what kind of mediator you wanna be before you get started, but it is helpful to have a sense of really just how broad and expansive this field is and therefore how exciting. So as you think about what is needed to be a mediator, I wanna share with you some qualities or skills that are common across most mediators and that you should seek to develop if you want to become a mediator. I can't overestimate the centrality of listening for mediation. You see, a big reason why parties often are in conflict, no matter what the issues are, is that they haven't felt heard by the other side. And so if you're to be successful as a mediator, you have to find a way to make sure all the parties in the mediation feel heard. Until you do that, you will not be successful at getting those parties to problem solve or to work with each other and resolve their conflict. Years and years ago, after I graduated from Harvard Law School, I clerked for a federal judge in Boston. One of the jobs of a federal law clerk is to enter the court before the judge goes in, and you make this kind of very grand announcement that the court is in session. And there's very specific language that is used, and I remember it um, from many years ago because there's an implication here, I think, for mediation. Um, I would walk out in a loud voice. I would say, all rise. The United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts is in session. All those having business before the Honorable George A. O'Toole Jr. of the United States District Court for Massachusetts shall come forward, hearken, and be heard. And I love that phrase even now because it embodies this key feature of every dispute resolution process, which is being heard. And so in mediation, part of your role is to make those other parties feel heard. Another critical quality of a mediator is patience. As a mediator, I can promise you there are going to be times when you're sitting there and you'll get angry and frustrated because you'll see these parties in conflict and they're hurting themselves and you can see so many better outcomes and they're not seeing it. Can you give us another minute, please? Nonetheless, you have to be patient. You have to be willing to sit with those parties in their struggle and create space for them to come to their own resolution. If you become frustrated with one or all the parties, your effectiveness as a mediator just goes away. A third important quality is to be master of process. So it's not the job of a mediator to actually craft a solution for the parties, because typically the problem in most mediations is actually not finding the right answer, but it's helping the parties get to some answer that works for them. And that means that as a mediator, what you are the master of is the process, not the substance. So you help to set ground rules, you help to sequence the moves, you help to guide the parties toward resolution. Fourth, mediators are really great at promoting creative, out-of-the-box thinking. Most mediations are much more complex and multi-issue than they might look like on the surface. And so being creative and helping the parties to a dispute be creative is a critical skill for a mediator. Fifth, and really importantly, is the quality of humility. Now, let me be clear about what I mean by humility here. Humility doesn't mean lacking confidence in your role as a mediator or confidence in directing the process. However, it does mean understanding that the contours of the solution actually lie in the wisdom of the parties whom you're mediating, not in yourself. Mediators who come to the table with the idea that they have the solutions and they know the situation often get themselves in real trouble. And even if the parties do defer to those kinds of mediators, these deals often don't last, they're not as robust, they're not as creative as the ones that the parties come to on their own. Humility then connects to good listening. It's a reminder that your job is creating space, opportunity, and process for parties to be heard, for parties to work together through challenging and really hard issues. It's not to come in from on high with the answer to their problems. At the end of the day, whether it is a nation at war or a family member in conflict, long after a mediator is gone, those parties are gonna to need to live with the result. So a good mediator remains humble about what their role is, what they can do, and what really remains in the domain of the parties. Okay, so if you are still with me and thinking, yes, this is even more exciting for me, and yes, I think I have those qualities, then let me offer for you four steps you can take to become a mediator. First, 
check with your local jurisdiction to see if there are any formal requirements to becoming a mediator. In most situations, this first step only applies if you want to be a court-connected mediator. By court-connected, I mean the kind of mediator who might volunteer in a small claims court. Many jurisdictions require some kind of maybe 32 or 40 hour training requirement for mediators who want to work with and be in a court. Now, in some instances, there may be other requirements or accreditations you need to mediate. But for the most part, and I would say this is for better or for worse, there are few, if any, formal legal requirements to begin your journey as a mediator. But that does not mean you can or you should just write, jump right into it. Because secondly, I strongly advise you to sign up for and take a mediation skills class, whether or not this is a jurisdictional requirement, and even if you think you are super creative, patient, and a great listener. I offer negotiation and mediation skills classes to the Cambridge Negotiation Institute, but if your jurisdiction requires you to take a class to mediate in court, you probably need to find a provider who is recognized by your particular state. Indeed, it is often through these providers that you'll also get some mediation opportunities. So there are a lot of reasons for taking a skills class. I mean, first and most importantly, you'll actually learn the skills and the practices that make for good mediation. But you'll also get a chance to actually practice and receive some feedback from others. And relatedly, it's actually a good way to just meet others who are interested in this field who might have some connections for taking your training to the real world of mediation. The kind of networking and relationship building from a training program can be really valuable for someone who wants to get started. Third, identify and work with mentors. If you're a law student or maybe in a master's program or a conflict resolutions program, it's probably easier for you to identify mentors whose work is in mediation and dispute resolution than it might be if you are on your own in the world without easy access to a mentor or someone who mediates in your area. Having said that, my experience is that many of my colleagues are actually quite keen to meet new people who want to get into our field. Because mediation is such an idiosyncratic profession that doesn't have a clear map or roadmap, most of us who do this work do it at least in part because we identified helpful mentors along the way. And so most of us are pretty keen to pay it forward to others, especially when we see folks with skill and passion and perseverance and hard work. Moreover, you actually learn a lot about mediation by watching others mediate. It's not uncommon for mediators to be looking for interns, sometimes to just help take notes during a mediation. In this current era of Zoom mediations, many mediators are really grateful to have assistance in like running the tech logistics for breakout rooms or monitoring or restricting chat or assisting with participants who might not be technologically adept at Zoom. On a number of occasions, I've actually mentored people who were very much my senior in the middle of their career and making a pivot to mediation. And in these cases, I've always been impressed not just by their thoughtfulness and self-reflection, but also just from their willingness to learn from the bottom up, despite the fact that they were very successful in the careers from which they were coming. So if you're looking for a mentor, let me offer a few more thoughts. First, as much as many mediators genuinely are interested in mentoring new people in the field, don't always expect a yes. So if you're given a task um, before someone will take you on as a mentee, don't be discouraged. This is not done as some kind of Wizard of Oz tactic to get rid of you. Uh, you may remember from the movie Wizard of Oz that when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion first show up at the Wizard, he gives them this impossible task of getting the broomstick from the Wicked Witch. Um, and he does this largely on the assumption that they will never get the broomstick and that they will never come back. Uh, this is actually not why a possible mentor will give you an additional task. Uh, typically, they're doing that because they want you to actually learn a bit more about the field um, at, so that you're better informed before they take you on. Um, and in truth, it's also the case that there's a set of people who actually won't do that task. They will get discouraged. And so it's a way for a possible mentor to determine who's actually serious about getting involved and who isn't. Fourth, get as much experience as you can. As you meet more people in the field, you might be offered some opportunities to do work for no or very low pay. Now, this is a very frustrating part of our field, and it's one that I personally want to see change. I believe really strongly that work should be compensated for fairly. And when it isn't, it makes it really challenging for those who can't afford to do free or low paying work 
to get experience they need to be successful in a profession. And that in turn leads to lack of diversity in a profession. And so this is unfortunately definitely true in the mediation field. And yet I have to say that there are times in the beginning parts of your career in this field when you may be offered some opportunities to get some experience, even low or no paying ones. And I would say, if you can afford to, please say yes to that. My entry to this field was decades ago. I can't tell you how many free and low paying gigs I did to get some experience. In fact, the first time I was paid at all, I had to fly from Boston to Detroit, from Detroit to Traverse City, then rent a car and travel three hours to do a gig before several hundred people where I got paid a total of $300. That was a lot of work for $300, but honestly, it was the first time I actually got paid and so I was super excited. So I feel awkward uh, continuing to give this advice to um, do work for free or low pay, um, and yet I do know that if you can afford it, it is a way to get into our field. And so now let me offer a final tip for being successful in mediation. Because the more work you do in this field, the more variety of styles and skills and approaches you'll see. And, and that is a very, very good thing because it helps you build and expand your repertoire. But at the end of the day, I have found that the most trusted, the most desired, the most successful mediators are the ones who really simply are just themselves. One of the mediators I most admire in the world is Ken Feinberg. He mediated many disputes um, in this country and was charged with designing the 9-11 Compensation Fund that compensated families who lost loved ones on 9-11 in exchange for a release of their claims against the government. I have tremendous respect for him. I consider him a model and a mentor, and he's undeniably an incredibly successful mediator. I've learned so much from him. And yet, one of the things that I learned is his style isn't my style. Over time, I've learned that I'm most effective when I learn from and listen to colleagues and mentors but then lean into what makes me, me. I tend to emphasize emotion, feeling, perception, and narrative more than some other mediators. My style tends to be more relational and attentive to what lies beneath. Part of why developing your style matters is that when you are working with people in conflict, you're often seeing really great people at their very worst. And it's important that what you present in an initial interview or an initial client call is what these people are getting at the most challenging moments in their life. Maybe their career is at stake, or their family, or their community, or their school. So quite apart from advice for mediation, letting yourself be you and developing your own approach and style is pretty much always good advice for success in a career and always good advice for success in mediation. So if you want to learn more about negotiation and negotiation skills, make sure to watch my video, How to Improve Your Negotiation Skills. Of course, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you don't miss out on any content, and stick around and watch the next video. Here comes the video. Don't go anywhere, keep watching. Go ahead, improve those negotiation skills.